Hello everyone. Welcome to my channel, Accounting for Real. First and foremost, my song playing in the background. Uh, so I have a few things to talk about today. But first, let's start off with a little exercise routine. Let's start off. So let's go like this. About let's do twenty of these. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And you can just do, if you feel like you want to lean a little bit. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. 19, 20. And then also, let's go 1, 2, 3, 4. And then go on the other side. We're going to do uh, 10 on one side, 10 on the other side. So let's go 1, 1, 2, 3, 4. Work those legs. 5, 6. Seven, eight, nine, ten. If you come up, go back. Twelve, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. 18, 19, 20. And then let's do, what about we do, put our legs up like this. Your thighs up. Let's do, let's do 20 of those. Ready? One, two, three. Let's go. One, two. And swing those arms like that. Three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Okay, so let's see, let's two. Let's see what else we can do. Let's just put your hands on your hips and let's just do. Uh, let's go. Let's just, let's just do this 20 times because this can work work those uh, kinks out the shoulders. So let's go. One, two, three, four. Let's go. One, two, three, four. Work those, uh, pull those, uh, pull that uh, pelvic area in. So five, six, seven, eight. Now, look those shoulders, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay, so there's three. Let's do uh, a couple more. Uh, uh, let's see. Okay, let's do... Uh, Let's do, let's, let's do a neck exercise. So let's do 20. You know, just move your neck around right there. Ready? One, two, three, four, five. Let's go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Then you get the other side. Eleven, twelve, thirteen. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So you do neck exercise. Okay, let's do a couple more. Uh, let's see. Let's go. Let's uh, let's take our uh, take your leg and just up like that. Ten on this leg and ten on the other leg. So let's go. Two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Lift them thighs. There's ten on that side. Let's do the other leg. One, two, three. Hold your balance. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12, 13, 14, hold your balance right there, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, there you go, okay, let's do, uh, let's do, let's just take, work, work the pelvic area, let's do, let's do this 20 times, okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, let's go, one, two, three, four. Take it on, just do that five, six, seven, eight, nine. Put a pelvic area in the ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Okay, let's do one more, and then I want to get to my lesson. So let's go, and what I want to do is go, go down, up, down, down, up, and I want to do 20 of those, so let's get started, you ready? One, two, three, four, let's go, so let's go, one, up, two, up, three, let's do like this, pull that pelvic area in, three, four, five, six, Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Okay, that's it. That is a little ten minute workout. All right, so. So what I want to get started with today, class, is okay. Just want to get started with a little, a few little things today. So as I told you before, I have three books in the Google Play Store that's published, and this is the this is the third book I have in the Google Play Store. I'm the eBooks, and this is uh. My brother Billy is different. So, and then this is a uh, fourth book I'm working on. And uh, this book right here, I have to just type it up. This is the next book I have I'm working on. So, uh, it's called uh, Johnny, Johnny, his dog Dusty, and the Mysterious Tree. So, this is not about autism, so this is just about. Uh, so I, I finished it. I just have to type it up so that I'll be putting it in the Google uh, Partner Center. So my brother Billy is different. So this is the this is the first page. So my brother Billy is different. So it's already in the Google Play Store, but as I was talking about earlier in my other two videos. Uh, I did two. I did a video for uh, since we are twins, and the other book uh, we have on channel. So pretty much, I did this book the same way. So this is the back of the book. So pretty much, I did this the same way. So what I did, I I used to procrastinate. So what I did, I stopped procrastinating, and I just you know went on and I went on and finished the book. So I stopped procrastinating and I went and finished the book. And I wrote, you know, in my spare time and I just kept on writing and writing and writing. So and then I found um I found uh, you know, I looked at some other publishers. I looked at a lot of publishing companies, but some of them were too high, so some of them were too high, so I found DigiCard and the rest is history. So uh I found DigiCard, but this one right here, I didn't get it. 
I didn't get a hard copy with Disney card yet, but uh, I, have, I will do that shortly. But this is uh, in the Google Play Store, so I uploaded this to uh, the Partner Center. So you can find this book uh, in the Google Play Store and the ebooks. My brother Billy is different. In the other book, I had other two books. We have twin. We are twins. Since we are twins, and we have autism. So, so I don't, you know, have too much to say right now about the book. But I'm just saying this is in the Google Play Store, and you can, you want to write your own book. Uh, you know, keep on writing, continue to write. Don't let nothing stop you. So what I did with all three of my books. I procrastinated, but with God willing, thanks, thanks be to God that I finished all three of them. And uh, so you can do the same. And um, I thought it wasn't possible because I, I, when I did my research on a lot of those, uh, a lot of publishing companies, that, you know, book publishing companies that out, that's out here, when I did my research, I found that they were a little too high. But I said, you know what, I probably would never get my book out there, but then... I kept on doing research and it took it took me some time and I didn't never give up. I said, you know what, I'm gonna get this book out there. I'm gonna get my books out there. But sometimes things can stunt your growth. And sometimes I don't know if some of these companies, publishing companies don't want to see you get your book done. It looked like they would make it easier for people that don't have much. They're just trying to get their word out there. So because the price they say like they priced their publishing uh I guess they well, I can say they uh, in other words they're publishing in other words they're publishing uh not responsibility but their services I guess. I guess I would say they price their publishing services too high and it almost prices out the poor. It almost prices out the poor that may have a story to tell too. So I know I took right in there uh, up uh UDC right here in Washington DC. And, all, and when I was in Australia University, I did a lot of writing too. All my courses we did writing. We, we, we did, uh, you know, we did a lot of writing, research and writing. So that's basically what college is about: research, writing, writing paragraphs, writing papers. So a lot of times these publishing companies they try to price the poor out. It's almost like the housing market where you go, they're pricing out the poor, and you're forced to live in a lot of these. Uh, Low class neighborhoods with a lot of crime and you know what not. So, but things should be if things were a little if things were a little more fair, then we all would be doing good. But so we can't sit back and worry about that. But so so that went down and I you know did my research and I found that these publishing companies were a little too high. But I did run across Biggie Card. And they made my dreams come true. They printed my uh, they printed my book uh, just the way I wanted. My first two hard copies. Since we are twins and we have autism, so my dreams came true when I found Biggie Card. And the price wasn't the price wasn't too high. I was I was able to pay for my book, get them printed up, get my barcode, get my book copy written, and I was on my way. I was on my way. I became a uh, published author right here in Washington, D.C. So they made my dreams come true. So thank God for Digi Card. And um, so that is that with the books. And I just want to talk a little bit about uh, when I was down Strayed University. I took a class called, um, I forgot the name of the class, but I know this is the book. This might be the name of the class here. The Humanistic Tradition. This is the book. So we learned a lot about, you know, different, um, say we got another one on the front. They say the global village of the 20th century. So I learned a lot of stuff dealing with the 20th century. So, and then inside the book, I do have, um, also in the front of, in, in the inside of the book, uh, you see, uh, we have, uh, Mona Lisa, the picture of Mona Lisa. And what it says is, uh, it says, uh, the Dada movement, another movement which aggressively broke. Uh, with tradition and even further undertook to challenge, to challenge the very nature of art was the Dada movement, 
founded in 1916 in Zurich, Switzerland. Switzerland. This loosely knit group of European painters and poets regarded the Great War as evidence of a world gone mad. They dedicated themselves to spreading the gospel of irrationality. The nonsensical name of the movement, Dada, French for hobby horse, uh, which was chosen by inserting a pen a pen knife at random into the pages of a dictionary symbolized their uh, irreverent stance. If the world had gone mad, should, should not its art be equally mad? They answered this with, uh, with art produced by chance, which constituted uh, an assault on all forms of preconceived order and uh, uh, artistic, I mean, artistic convention. The Dadaist, the Dadaist, the Dada, the Dadaists met frequently at the Cafe Baltic Baltier in Zurich, where they orchestrated noise concerts and recited poetry informed uh, by impro 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 improvis improvisation and free association. The Romanian poet Trizan Tazara produced poems from words cut out of newspapers and randomly scattered on the table while the French sculptor uh, and poet Gian Op, uh, French sculptor and poet Gian Op constructed colleges and relief sculptures from shapes arranged according to the laws of chance. Such attacks on Western tradition and on modern techno or techno technocracy in general reflected the spirit of nihilism, the denial, denial of traditional and religious and moral principles that flowered in the ashes of the war. In his lecture on Dada in 1922, Tazara declared, the acts, the acts of life have no beginning or end. Everything happens in a completely idiotic, idiotic way. Simplicity is called Dada, like everything in life, Dada is, use, is useless. As with poetry and painting, Dada Theater paid homage to Freud, Freud by liberating, you know, Sigmund Freud, the id, the ego, and the, the id, the ego, and the super ego, as one French playwright explained, narrative realism and traditional characterization gave way to improvis improvisation and a performance of random and bizarre incidents. One form of Dada theater, the theater of cruelty, known for its violent and scatological themes, anticipated theater of the absurd plays written during the 1950s and 60s. And so they have, I guess, uh, this painting was, it's a Marcel Duchamp rectified ready, ready made pencil on a reproduction of the Mona Lisa. So Marcel Duchamp. Mm -hmm. So this is a nice book. Uh, this, the, the, the teacher was, the teacher for this class was kind of hard. You know, he was kind of hard. So let's see what else I can pull out of this. Visionary surrealist. Uh, visionary surrealist. Surrealist. See, this is the different painting. Um, so it says, uh, visionary surrealist uh, Magri Magritte, Dali, and, and Kahlo. While Picasso, Mauro, and Klee favored abstract organic images, other surrealists combined met meticulously painted objects in ways that were shocking or unexpected. The most remarkable visionary surrealists were Rene Magritte, Salvador Dali, and Frida, Frida uh, Kahlo. All three were superb draft people whose tropical OL skills elicited a disquieting dream reality, profound, profoundly influenced by the Chirico, the Belgian artist, Magritte, 1898-1967, uh, juxtaposed realistically detailed objects in startling, startling and irrational ways. In one of Magritte's uh, Bright's paintings, a coffin takes the place of a reclining figure. In another in another bird cage is substituted for the head of the sitter, and in still another, human toes appear on a pair of leather shoes. They painted some real, 
they painted some real uh painting. Mm -hmm. They painted some real paintings that were different. In other words, they say uh, uh, visionary surrealist uh, McGright. That's the name. His name. That's, I guess that's the last name. McGright, Dowdy, and Callum. They painted uh, different portraits than uh, Picasso, Myro, and Clee. See, they say Picasso, Myro, and Clee. See, Pablo Picasso. We read about him too. Pablo Picasso, Myro, and Clee are favorite abstract organic images. And so, in other words, they were surrealist painters. And other surrealists combined with met meticulously painted objects in ways that were shocking or unexpected. So, I don't want to paint nothing that's shocking and unexpected. I want to paint something that's. Uh, Something that's you know real. We well, I took art too when I was um, well, I took art, you know, when I was in high school, and I, you know, we had to paint still life. So okay, then here goes a summary. Okay, in summary. I'm just, just reading a couple of things about the book. Sigmund Freud's theories concerning the nature of the human psyche, the significant uh, significance of dreams. And the dominating role of human sexuality had a revolutionary effect on the beliefs, attitudes, and morals of modern society. They were equally influenced, influential upon the arts. In literature, uh, Proust, Kafka, and Joyce are representative of the modern novelist's preoccupation with the subconscious life and with the role of memory as shaping reality. Their fiction reflects a fascination with the methods and principles of Freudian psychoanalysis, psycho, psycho, psychoanalysis, stream of consciousness, narrative, and interior monologue are among the literary techniques used by modern authors to develop plot and character. The poetry of the poetry of E. E. Cummings reveals the influence of free uh, association and liberating words from the bounds of syntax and conventional transcription. Uh, in the visual arts, Freud's impact uh, generated a wide variety of styles that gave free play to fantasy and dreams. The, express the expressionism of Munch and Kirchner, the metaphysical art of the of the Chirico and the f fantasies of Chag Chagall examined the mysteries of repressed fears and desires. The Dada movement spread the gospel of uh, the Dada movement spread the gospel of um, uh, irrationality and randomly organized words and images. Duchamp, the most outrageous of the Dada cultists, championed a nihilistic uh, anti-art spirit that had far-reaching efforts in the second half of the century. So just a few little things I'll just read out the book. Hey, this look like uh, Play-Doh right here. This look like, uh, that look like Play-Doh. Or oh, soccer team. Uh, uh, so, let's see what else I have. And then, uh, this is another book. This is uh, The Humanist. The yeah, humanistic tradition. Oh, they they all with the same with the proper. This is um, realism and the modernist turn, romanticism. Um, so we're gonna learn about different people in this book here too, as well. The humanistic tradition. So I learned. I took this class at Australia University. So this is what the inside looks like. Mm -hmm. So let me read a little bit about uh. We have um, Thurl from Walden, from Thurl's Walden. Near the end of March, 1845, I borrowed an axe and went down to the woods by Walden Pond, uh, nearest to where I intended to build my house, and began to cut down some tall, arrowy white pines, still in their youth for timber. It was a pleasant hillside where I worked, covered the pine woods through which I looked out on the pond. In a small open field in the woods where pines and hickories were springing up. This is uh, David uh, Waldo Thurl. 
So the ice in the pond was not yet dissolved, though though there were some open spaces and it was all dark colored and saturated with water. There were some sl uh, slight flurries of snow during the days that I worked there. But for the most part, when I came out onto the railroad on my way home, its yellow sand heat uh, stretched away, gleaming in the hazy atmosphere, and the rail shone in the spring sun. And I heard the lark and peewee and other birds already come to, co to commence another year with us. They were pleasant uh, spring days in which the winter of man's discontent was thaw thawing as well as the earth. And the life that had lain torpid uh, began to stretch itself. One day when my axe had come off and I had cut a green hickory for a wedge, driving it with a stone, and had placed a hole to soak in the pond hole in order to swell the wood, I saw a striped snake run into the water. And he lay on the bottom, apparently without inconvenience, as long as I stayed there for more than a quarter of an hour, perhaps perhaps because he had not yet fairly come out of the torpid sink. It appeared to me that for for a like reason, men remain in their present low and primitive condition. But if they should feel the influence of the spring of springs ar arousing them, they would be necessity rise. Uh, no, they would of necessity rise to a higher and more ethereal light. I had previously seen the snakes in frosty morning in my path with portions of their bodies still numb and inflexible, waiting for the sun to thaw them out, to thaw them. On the 1st of April, it rained and melted the ice, and in the early part of the day, which was very foggy, I heard a stray goose groping about over the pond and crackling as if as if lost or like the spirit of the uh, fog. I went to the woods because I wished to live uh, deliberately to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not when it came to die, discover that I had not lived. I did not wish to live uh, what was not life. Mary is so dear. Nor did I wish to practice resignation unless it was quite necessary. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life. To live so sturdily and spartan like as to put to rout all that was not life. To cut a broad swath and shave close to drive life into a corner and reduce it to its lowest terms. And it and if uh, proved to be mean, why then to get the whole and genuine meanness of it and publish its meanness to the world? Or if it were uh, sublime, to know it by experience and be able to give a true account of it in my next excursion. For most men, it appears to me, are in a strange uncertainty about it, whether it is of the devil or of God, and have somewhat hastily concluded that it is the chief end of man here to glorify God and uh, enjoy him forever. So this is... Um, that's just a passage from uh, that's a passage from uh, uh, Thurl's Walden on, on Walden Pond. So he said he went into the woods. So imagine him going living in the woods um, with no food, no cell phones, and just living off, you know. So he said he went into the woods to see what he could not learn. So imagine him going somewhere and see what you cannot learn. It says, um, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to find only the essential facts of life. So he wanted to confront the essential facts of life, not, you know, living in a hotel where you got air conditioner and you got a cell phone, you got, you eat, you know, you go in your refrigerator and you get food, you can cook it. But so he said, I went to the woods because I wish to live deliberately, to find only the essential facts of life. So you get out in the woods, it's almost like an animal hunting for food, hunting for survival. Uh, and see, so it says, um, I went to the woods because I wish to live deliberately to find only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach. And that when I, uh, when, it, when I came to die, I discovered I had not lived. So... I guess he wanted to, I said, I did not wish to live what was not life. Living is so dear, nor did I wish to practice. 
resignation unless it was quite necessary. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life to live so sturdily in Spartan life as to put to rout all that was not life, to cut a broad swamp and shave close to drive life into a corner and reduce it to its lowest terms. And if, and if it proved to be mean, uh, why then to get the whole and genuine meanness of it and publish its meanness to the world? So in other words, I guess he, when he went down there uh, published it to the world, he let the world know how things turned out for him down there. So in other words, he went to the woods to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life. So the essential facts of life, in other words, uh, nature, what nature had to offer him, I guess. Um, he did not wish to live what was not or what was not life, living is so dear. Nor did, did he wish to practice resignation unless it was quite necessary. So in other words, he just wanted to see what he, he wanted to live deliberately to see what, you know, see what he could not learn. Imagine him living in the woods to see what uh, you could not learn and he wanted to live deliberately. He didn't want to live off all the... I think he lived down there for two years, but this passage doesn't say, but I think he stayed in the woods for two years. I know I studied, we learned about him at Australia University. So it says, um, and then we come down here to, um, so that's all, all walls and pond. That's in there. I think it's in a book too. I think it's a book. And then I come down here to uh, Walt Whitman's romantic individualism. Though, uh, though technically not a transcendentalist, Walt Whitman, 1818 and 1892, gave voice to the transcendental uh, worldview in his uh, euphoric poetry. Whitman followed Emerson's advice and lived according to the motto of self-reliance. He served as a male nurse in, a, in an American Civil War hospital and wrote articles and poems that celebrated his love for the American landscape. So that's Walt Whitman. Whitman took everyday life as his theme, but he rejected artificial po poetic diction more completely than words were. Uh, his natural voice uh, bellowed a barbar barbaric uh, yawp that found ideal expression in free verse, poetry based on irregular rhythm, rhythmic uh, patterns rather than on the conventional use of meter. Whit Whitman molded his, his bold rhythm and sonorous canvases by means of standard poet poetic devices such as alliteration, anisots, and uh, repetition. Whitman loved Italian opera. Walt Whitman loved Italian opera, and his style often simulates the musical grandeur, grandeur of that genre. He also loved the American landscape, a source of endless inspiration uh, for his sprawling cosmic images. In song myself, the longest of the lyric poems included in the autobiographical collection called Leaves of Grass. Uh, we come face to face with the expansive individualism that typified the romantic movement. At the same time, we are struck by Whitman's impassioned quest for unity with nature and with all humanity. So then, uh, here go Jack, Jack, Jacques Louis David, Napoleon Cross and the great Saint uh, Bernard uh, Pass. Passage, I guess. So this is Napoleon. So uh, you can't see it. I don't even see the words. But that's Napoleon. You know, the horse from Napoleon's diary. Okay, let's see. Oh, then we also have, here we go, we have a uh, Portrait of Frederick Douglass in the book, Portrait of Frederick Douglass. Mm -hmm. Portrait of Frederick Douglass. 
So let's see who else we have in here that we rec that I recognize. Now this is a picture of the Eiffel Tower in Chicago. I never really even been to Chicago. That's an Eiffel Tower in Chicago. Okay, here was Beethoven. The genius of Beethoven. Uh, the genius of Beethoven. The leading composer of the early 19th century. Uh, and one of the greatest musicians of all time. Uh, German-born Ludwig van Beethoven. 1770 to 1827. Uh, Beethoven lived most of his life in Vienna, where he became acquainted with Mozart and studied briefly with Hayden, a skillful pianist, organist, and violinist. Uh, Beethoven composed works in almost every medium and form. His 32 piano sonatas tested the express, expressive potential of an instrument that, having acquired in the early 19th century an iron frame and thicker string, was capable of extraordinary brilliance in tone, a feature that made the piano the most popular musical instrument of the 19th century. Uh, Beethoven's greatest uh, Beethoven's greatest enterprise was his nine symphonies. These remarkable compositions generally adhere to the format of the classical symphony, uh, but they move beyond the boundaries of classical structure and were longer and more complex than any instrumental compositions written by Mozart and Hayden. Nevertheless, his in his indebtedness, his indebtedness to classical composition makes him something of a bridge between the classical and the romantic uh, eras. By adding trombones and bass clarinet to the symphony orchestra and doubling the number of flutes, oboes, clarinets, and bassoons in his scoring, Beethoven vastly broadened the expressive range and dramatic power of orchestral sound. The expanded tone, color, and rich sonority, sonorities of Beethoven's symphonies, Beethoven's symphonies were in part the product of such instruments as the piccolo, bass drum, and cymbals, all of which Beethoven added to the symphony orchestra. In his use of musical dynamics, Beethoven was more explicit and varied than his classical predecessors. Like most romantic artists, Delacroix in particular comes to mind. Beethoven blurred the divisions between the structural units of a composition, exploiting textural contrast for expressive e effect. He often broke with classical form, uh, adding, for example, a fifth movement to his sixth uh, symphony, embellishing the uh, finale of his ninth symphony with a chorus and solo voices. Beethoven's daring uh, use of den denises, uh his sudden pauses and silence, silences, and his brilliant brilliance of thematic and rhythmic invention reflect his preference for dramatic spontaneity over measured regularity. The power, the powerful opening notes of the fifth of the Fifth Symphony, a motif that Beethoven is, is said to have called fate knocking at the door. So that's Beethoven. And then we have oh, Hickel, uh, Eugene Delacroix. Uh -huh. It's an oil painting of Eugene Delacroix. There's so many people in here. The, pia the piano music of Chopin. Uh, this is uh, Delacroix. So, you know, just touching base on a little bit, this is a picture of, uh, uh, let's see, back in the day, this is, these, uh, see how these old trains look back in the day, this is, uh, 
Matthew B. Brady, Brady or staff. This is an old train and stuff. Look. And this is 19. Yeah, 1933, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York, 1933. That's a train back in the day. And it had a birth of uh, photography. Take a picture of the stone breakers. The stone breakers. Uh, just trying to see if I had any pictures that. Uh, okay, so let me see what the next book I have. And then this is uh, this is the third one I had. This is the sixth one. The humanistic tradition. So, Chapel, but I don't have that in this book. Well, at least in this book, too. I don't have Michelangelo. He painted the, uh, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. So I don't have that in this book. Okay, so I guess that'll be it for those books. So. Change gears a little bit. I have a book too, also called Investigative uh, Investigation and Law Enforcement. So, this book right here, it's just a little course I was taking online. Uh, so, so, uh, so the history. The histor historical perspective of law enforcement, uh, they're supposed to prevent and investigate crimes, uh, to apprehend offenders, and to enforce and support the laws of society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then you have um, the birth of the modern uh, police force. That was started by uh, Sir Robert Peel. See, almost a century later, in 1829, the first police force, as we know it today, was created by Sir Robert Peel uh, in the same year of the Metropolitan Police Act. The uh, same year the Metropolitan Police Act was passed. This act allocate, allocated resources for Peel's 1,000 uniform uh, men. These men were soon dubbed Bobbies. They called Bobbies after their founder. 
It's still the name referred to law enforcement officers in England today. These officers operated under two principles. The belief that it was possible to discourage crime and to and practice and the practice of pre preventive patrol. So then they just have a picture of a uh, Robin. So, so in 1924, J. Edgar Hoover was appointed to direct the FBI. He sought to raise the standard of professionalism. New hires had to be college graduates. They were provided extensive training and assignments were made, uh, were made on a national basis. On July 1st, 1924, the Bureau opened its identification division, which served as a national clearinghouse for information on criminals. It began with fingerprint cards of over 800,000 individuals. So they're just showing you a little picture of uh, uh, J. Edward Hoover in 1924. Mm -hmm. And so what else we have here? So we got the NYPD uh, to understand the function and requirements of a local law enforcement officer and examination of the New York City Police Department is appropriate. So they tell you they got the patrol services, the transit bureau, housing, detective, organized crime control bureau, internal affairs bureau, and personnel uh, bureau. That's the New York Police Department. So then they tell you. You want to learn? It's things that you can just research online too. This is the criminal justice system. So the criminal justice system, the first model of how the criminal justice system works is called the consensus model. Uh, how how it works. So they tell you the steps you gotta go through. How how the system works. Arrest, booking, and first initial appearance. Uh, then we have a uh, so little course I was taking. Preliminary hearing. Uh, uh, we have uh, the grand jury, the arraignment. You have uh, the different steps in the process. Uh, we have the grand jury, the arraignment, we have the trial, people involved in the trial. So this is, you know, just something to read step. Crime in this investigation, an investigator is an individual who gathers documents and evaluates facts about a crime. Investigation is the process through which these are accomplished. The purposes of the investigator's actions are several. To establish that, in fact, a crime was committed, to identify and apprehend the suspect, to recover stolen property, to assist the state in prosecuting the party charged with the offense. Characteristics of the good investigator. So just a little course that is, you know, you can, I think this was um, Stratford Career Institute. So I didn't finish the course, but it seemed like a course that I might, wouldn't mind going back. Mm-hmm. Then it got, um, so conducting the interviews and, you know, what you're working on. So this is, I think this is just one. This was just one. Uh, just one book that was in class. So, so one, one last, uh, one last uh, book that I want to just, you know, this is also I took another course at Stratford Career Institute, and it's accounting and corporations. I took, um, I took a cat in Australia too. I took a 
you know, business, business law, county, managerial county, but this is a county for corporations. So I took this uh, from Stratford. So this is a good book too. So this is a good book. It shows you uh, practicing with carrying assets. Show you how you pick out uh, assets and um, uh, liabilities. You know, in other words, you want to do a um, you want to do an income statement. You want to know which to pick out what items to pick out for the income statement. You know, income statement revenues minus expenses. And or uh, uh, equals net income. Then you want to do a balance sheet. As uh, assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. And this is just an example of a trial balance. So in other words, you're doing a trial balance. Uh, basically, you would put all your accounts. You would put all your accounts down on your on your trial balance. And then you will uh, add up all your debits and credits, and then you will see if everything uh, match up. Or you can just do a practice uh, income statement and a practice balance sheet separate. So you can, you know, as a manager, that would be a good thing to do. So we have cash, temporary investments, accounts receivable, dividend revenue receivable. So those are that would, those would be assets, prepaid insurance. So in other words. You, you know, you're doing a balance sheet or you're doing an income statement, you pick out those items that go in uh, those statements. And this is an income statement. So income statement right here, revenues minus expenses. So, in other words, you do something like this. You can just pick, put your own uh, See, that's a income statement. We have uh, less cost of goods sold, gross, gross profit. There's no, there are no figures on here, so you can put your own figures. You got your operating expenses, your rent expense, uh, salaries expense, wages expense, insurance expense, depreciation expense, uh, miscellaneous expense, total operating expenses. Then you have a, you have your operating income, your dividend revenue. So different ones when you're doing your income statement, you. Add all your uh, expenses, add all your revenues, and minus your expenses from your revenue. That's where you get your net income. So this was just a copy. I mean, this is this is just a sample. This is like a workbook too. So you can, you know, like a a, a study book and a workbook. All right. So this is the income statement right here. You have your. So this one right here has figures. So we have the best cost of goods sold, goods profit, operating expenses, so all the expenses are added up, you have a minimum, and expenses pay $15,800. And then so the expenses come out on revenue, and that's when we get the income at the bottom. Yep, so so and then and so just a couple more things and then I'm gonna end the video class. Uh so what I have here is this is just a, uh, some items on a balance sheet. This is just some items on, that goes on the balance sheet. It's just telling you this is just an asset that you can pick out for your balance sheet. So, you know, so in other words, you got a balance sheet. You pick out your cash, your cash receivables. And these are the carry value of receivables. We have the inventory, temporary investments, prepaid insurance. And these are just the total current assets. So these are just the assets for the balance sheet. So, in other words, if you have a balance sheet, you still have to pick out, uh, in other words, if you're running your business and you're looking at your books, 
So you take all your assets and add all your, all your assets up together. Then you want to add your liabilities up and your owner's equity. You just subtract your owner's equity. I mean, you add your, you add your owner's equity to your liabilities and it should equal your assets. So that is on the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. So this is just giving you the assets, total assets. You know, just some of the items that you know that you put, you know, if you're doing a balance sheet, you have to know, you know, which items to pick out. So, that's all that's giving you. And then, so in other words, revenues minus expenses is your uh, income statement. Revenues minus expenses. So, you know, we have your sales revenue and your revenue. So, we add that up to 30000 and we add all our payables. These are all our liabilities. Hold on, you know what? Uh, payables. Okay, no. See, these don't go on the. These do not go on the income statement. So what goes on the income statement is So, what we're doing is So you know, you're picking out your uh you So what I would do, when I asked him to go to the library, I would look on this sheet here, and I would um, pick out um, my assets. So I would call him my assets, I said, ask him, I asked him to go to the library, I have cash, I have buildings, uh, inventory, my college shares, he paid his shorts, he would be, I'm 
I'm going to end on this note today, class. So, I want to end on this note today, class. I want to say thanks for joining me today. I did my little workout exercise in the beginning. Then I did uh, a, little, a few items from my uh, my law enforcement. Uh, of course, I took a course uh, in law enforcement. I took a course in law enforcement, but uh, that was some time ago, so I still had those books with that. And I took uh, uh, county for corporations, I took that class too. And also took uh, managerial accounting at Australia University, and I took uh, business law, you know, some business classes. That's how I got my degree at Australia University right here in Washington, D.C. So, class, thanks for joining me today. I don't want to stay too long, it's already been an hour. And it's just about dinner time, so I'll see you next time. Same place, same time, same channel, County for Real. Hope you meet me back here again. And next time, I want to see whatever exercise uh, I gotta get an exercise routine, uh, some healthy, uh, healthy uh, menus, healthy menus uh, for my. Um, my cooking segment. So thank you for joining me today, class, and I hope to see you back here again, same place, same time, I'm kind of for real. So enjoy your weekend, and I want to send my prayers out to all you YouTubers, and enjoy the Super Bowl coming on. This is the Super Bowl. I think the Super Bowl is Sunday. Yes, the Super Bowl is Sunday, the third. Is that the third of um? the second, the second or the third of February, but enjoy your Super Bowl, don't eat too many unhealthy snacks, so come back again, uh, subscribe below, subscribe below, and um, uh, you know, just, just view, review, just view some of my videos, I have some good videos, so I'll be trying to put out, you know, plenty more. Uh, great content on my channel. I just sometimes sit down and think and see what I can, you know, provide to you on my channel. So I'm thinking all the time. I'm trying to get my brain together and I'm trying to be productive, trying to provide great quality, entertaining content, educational as well. So I'm still working on that computer information system and systems for my organization. So managers have to. Uh, bringing that, uh, uh, that, well, actually, the, the information system, we're bringing that uh, quality, pertinent information so managers, managers and owners can make decisions for my organization. So my organization is just like a make-believe. Make I'm just, you know, making like I have a business so I can be set things up, say, hey, you have a business, you got your target market, you, be, you got your niche, your target market, your business, your business name. You have an online presence, you have a storefront presence, you want to build your brand, you want to build your brand, co-branding or whatever you're doing, then you're building your brand, you're building a strong product and uh, quality, strong, quality and strong products, products, you make it cool. So you're trying to build that brand, you're building those quality products, you're building those, you're building those, um, building strong uh, quality services. Great customer service. Uh, it's all about making decisions, day-to-day -day decisions, day-to-day -day decisions of the manager, of the owners. So it's a lot to deal with when you deal with business. So I can just talk, 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 talk. But I ain't gonna talk too long. I try to do just about an hour. So class, thanks for joining me today. Hope to see you back here again. Enjoy your weekend. Today is Friday, uh, January the 31st. So tomorrow, Saturday, February the 1st. So this is It'll be spring in a minute, so you know, just waiting on that snow. Hopefully, we'll get some snow here in Washington, D.C. before before the spring rolls around here. So, class, thanks for joining me today, and I hope to see you back here again, same place, same time. And you all have a good one.